Okay, hello everybody and welcome to Avid Reader Online. Thank you for joining us tonight uh, for, the, for the launch of Clementine Board's new book, How We Love. Uh, before we begin, I would like to begin by acknowledging the traditional owners of the land of which I'm current, currently on in Mianjin, the Yagara and Turrbal people, as well as the traditional owners of the lands from which you are joining us from on Zoom from all over the country. I pay my respect to elders past, present and emerging. emerging. Sovereignty has never been ceded. It always was and always will be Aboriginal land. For our audience, you'll be muted for the session tonight. Uh, should you have any questions, please type them into the chat box and send them to me, the events at Avid Reader, um, and I will answer them. You're also welcome to leave your video on if you'd like. Just make sure you're set um, to speak of you so that you can see Clem and Alice uh, on the full screen. Um, I will also send through a link of where you, you can purchase your copy of How We Love. Um, and that will also show you how you can use the chat function, which you'll need uh, for our Q&A session at the end, which will be uh, about 10, 15 minutes at the end. So if you have any questions throughout the event uh, for Clem, just send them through to me uh, and then we'll get them all answered at the end. Uh, and enjoy the night. So I'd love to introduce you to our conversation partner for tonight. Um, so we have Alice Robinson and Alice is a good friend of Clem's. And as you can see, they are sitting together, which is lovely. So that's something a bit different uh, often on our Zoom chats the author and the conversation partner are in different places so it's nice to have them together so i'll pass over to you alice thank you so much welcome everyone it's so lovely to see you all my name's alice robinson i'm the author of two novels anchor point and the glad shout and i'm here with my friend Clem, who probably needs no introduction, but as we were waiting to come in, I was thinking of all the things that she's been called, <laughs> the nice things. She's a, an entrepreneur, a girl boss, a raconteur, an angry feminist, uh, and maybe now a lover, and yeah, my, my wonderful friend. And we're here to celebrate the publication of her beautiful new book, her third book, which I think is already a bestseller. Is that right? I mean, who it tracks is. these things? <laughs> it's amazing. Um, such an impressive woman, as I'm sure you all know. Clem, I've got so many questions written down here in a, in a blue text. And I should say as well that we uh, have three little kids here with us because we're both mums and we're both the only adults in our household. So it's possible that... Uh, they'll make an appearance and um, uh, as we were saying earlier but while we're getting set up one of the lovely things about this weird COVID time is that the barriers between the domestic and and work life have really broken down and I think for women anyway that's a wonderful thing because it's a reality in our lives so mm -hmm. if that happens we'll roll with it. Clem I want to ask you first of all I've got so many questions here but whether you think that love is a feminist issue? Well, before I answer that question, I just wanted to say thank you so much to Avid Reader for hosting this event and also to my dear, beautiful soulmate, Alice <laughs> Robinson, for doing the, the conversation with me, which I kind of badgered her into. Um, <laughs> Not at all. And also to all of you wonderful people who've logged on in a time when online has become very tiring for a lot of people, and, and I appreciate it so much. I also, um, you might have noticed that while uh, Alice was talking, I changed the, the name. It's something that I had Rachel McPhail on my podcast recently, and Rachel McPhail is the incredible... Um, Aboriginal woman who has been spearheading a campaign for Australia Post to include a line on our addresses where we can include the country that we're on. And one of the things that she said was that in these things, which we can already add our pronouns to, that we can add the country that we're on. So you don't have to do that now if you don't want to, but I would love to invite all of you in, you know, going forward with these online events to acknowledge the country where, where you're on, where we sit, because, um, mm. yeah, it's something that Rachel uh, really got me thinking about and it's something easy that we can do to change the way that we think about stuff. Um, and obviously I'm saying that 
as a white person, and I'm, I know that there may not only be white people in this conversation. So when I say we, I'm not assuming that collective we. Um, but yes, that being said, is love a feminist issue? Um, I think it is. I think that love is a human issue and feminism is a human condition and the, the things are inextricable from each other. And one of the things that's been really interesting about discussing this book and and I get it too and I, I do get it because it is surprising to a lot of people that I would concern myself with the interior life of love and being broken in some ways and what it means to to love as a human in the world but for me it's actually not that strange at all because it's all of all that motivates feminism and social justice is motivated by love. It's not motivated by, by hate. Anyone who participates in social justice knows that. Hate is the accusation that's used by people who don't want to change the systems that oppress so many. It's used as a way to discredit and gaslight us. But, but actually, you would only do that work if you are motivated by love because everyone else who doesn't care about it is motivated by selfishness. Hmm. And I think as well, and I think this is threaded through your book as well, the complexities around the way that love as an idea or a, a desire, something that we want to have in our lives, um, intersects with domesticity and, and work and children and the things that put, you know, that are gendered. Yeah. And it's funny that as you're saying that, I'm suddenly aware, and maybe there are some people there who've got kids in the house of them too, but I'm suddenly aware of how much your half of your brain, particularly as a, as a single mother who works and who is in environments like this, half of your brain is always focused on what to do if the domestic life suddenly um, impinges on the personal, on the professional life. And it's kind of that old adage where women in particular are expected to work as if they don't have children mm. and mother as if they don't work. Um, yeah. I, I, it, that kind of intersects with something that I really wanted to ask you, and I don't think we've ever spoken about this. Um, in the, lock, the long lockdowns that we experienced in Melbourne, Clem and I spent a lot of time walking around because that was a sanctioned activity that you could do with someone else and often carrying our little cups of wine. And in all that time, I don't think we ever spoke about this, but I would love to know whether you think the focus on romantic love in the culture is gendered. Like mm. who, who does it serve? Because it, I mean, maybe before you answer that question, I should ask, do you think that, um, that rom would you agree that romantic love is privileged in the culture above other forms of love? Absolutely. And I think that romantic heteronormative love in yeah. particular is privileged. And I should say as well from the outset, I meant to say this at the start, so my apologies, Alice. For anyone who's read the book, Alice is the book the book is dedicated to Alice and Alice <laughs> is the kind of like mysterious figure throughout the book where you're first introduced and um, because my editors who are incredible and they know a lot more than I do about how to structure a book and my publisher suggested this, that there at least be some introduction to Alice when she first appears in the book. And so I sort of said, I kind of gave an introduction of sorts, but in writing the book, how, how do you introduce someone who is so profoundly important to your life, but who transcends everything that we understand and that has been, you know, culturally dictated to us about the importance of love, that unless someone is your, like, girlfriend or your romantic person, that somehow they... Or your spouse. Or your spouse, that they can't occupy this space. And I would love to later on talk about that article that you sent me about Philippa um, mm. Foote and Iris Murdoch. Um, but Alice appears she's introduced in the book briefly and then at all other points I just referred to her as Alice even if she kind of not appeared in the chapter at all I just said Alice tells me this and when my editor said to me you know do you think in each chapter you should remind people who Alice is and I was like I don't want to do that because I structurally want the book I want Alice to be a figure in the book who kind of informs lots of things that I've learned about love and informs a a very precious kind of love that if we are lucky, we'll be able to have a glimpse of in our life. And that for me, like, it's not, it, it can't be reduced to something that as simplistic as romantic love, you know, because it's so much more 
complex than that and so much more alive than what that is. And I, and I really hoped that in writing it that way, that people would get this sense that Alice was this kind of mysterious person, but who, who was so essential to my life that she, I almost, and I also just occurred to me as well that maybe I didn't want to tell people all that much about you because I wanted to keep you for myself a little bit. Um, I'm just thinking that it's, I'm laughing as you're saying this because I'm a very earnest and um, open-hearted kind of character who in real life, you know, like just can't shut up. And so the idea that I would be a mysterious character is pretty funny. Well, <laughs> but I, I know, appreciate you know, that. that. Thank you know, you. you know how I feel about you. Um, so the romantic love mm. taking primacy is one of the things that I really wanted to explore with this book. I'm not sure how many people who are present in this session have read the book or how many are hopefully looking forward to reading the book, but it's certainly not, for those of you who haven't read the book, it's certainly not a book about all the people I've been out with, you know, <laughs> and those, and those books are fine. Those yeah. books are fine. They can be really funny and they can be really instructive and informative, but well, the, also it would just be too long, Clementine. They would be very short, actually. Um, but the for me, I'm not really interested in romantic love. And it's it's served a purpose in my life, and I hope it will serve as a purpose for the rest of my life in some sense. But it's not even the most important kind of love that I've experienced, and it's not the most important one that I'm pursuing. So for me, all of the other explorations of love around that even though of course it is in the book but mostly in a thwarted sense really mm. um has been much more instructive about the human condition and what it means to be alive in the world and what and what really essentially the pursuit of love is which is as I say in the book the desire to be known and to be seen and to be remembered do you think though I guess underneath that question I ask about the primacy of romantic love I guess what I'm thinking is if it's true that we live in a patriarchy and that most things in our world therefore are structured around that premise, then, then could it also be true that the idea of romantic love privileges men in some way? Hmm. I mean, we know that that's true. That but romantic... I kind of don't want it to be true. It's but it depressing. is true. It is true. And, you know, we're, again, speaking from, it's a very heteronormative idea of what makes love valid. And neither you, I mean, Alice and I are both queer women who have experience of all different kinds of romantic love. But I would say that, I can't speak for you, but I would say that I've definitely been influenced in my life to my detriment and, and to a way that I feel really resentful of about this importance of the romantic love, particularly in a kind of conforming heteronormative way that, to find, I mean, it's so reductive. We know that like statistically speaking, and again, I'm just speaking about women who marry men, statistically speaking, women who marry men are less likely to be happy than mm -hmm. men who marry women. And the domestic inequality that still exists in so many households, not just across Australia, but all over the world to varying degrees, tells us that the situation of heteronormative love and rom the romantic pursuit of it is a lie but it's one that even when you know it in your head, it takes a long time to unpack it and to, to realise that it doesn't serve you. And I've been thinking a lot lately about, you know, you're about to turn 40. I turned 40 a few months ago and I've been having a lot of discussions with friends of a similar age about this kind of shift in thinking that has happened around the pursuit of romantic love and, and the different kinds of purposes that love serves in our life and how it's it feels almost like it's come out of the blue this sort of just not it's not even despondency but it's kind of like just discernment you know that I do it unless unless something is going to serve a purpose in my life romantically there is no point to me I don't want it just for the sake of having it and I know that that is a privilege to be able to to reject romantic love in that sense because for a lot of people obviously the choice to entangle themselves with someone is economic um mm. or even even one of safety yeah but just purely speaking like on an ideological level about what romantic love is it occurred to me recently that this is how I've been thinking about it and then I was like oh maybe this is what women of a certain age have 
always been trying to tell me, <laughs> but that when I was young, I just, in a very sexist kind of way, dismissed that knowledge and dismissed that experience because, of course, we're also taught to see older women as being inherently kind of um, bitter, mm. particularly older women who who disrupt the idea around what women should have and should want. But it's also, it is interconnected with that patriarchal thing of, um, like, if your worth is premised on your sexuality or your beauty, then necessarily, according to the culture, those things fade with age. Yeah. So why would we listen to older women? Yeah, and that, and that also the kind of, I wouldn't even say undertone, the sexist tone of that <laughs> is that once you become an older woman, and I've had older women say this to me my whole life, that you become invisible. And yeah. some of them really mourn that and they really grieve that loss of And some of, of them seem to embrace it, don't Some they? of them fucking love it. And yeah. they, they, but it is that sort of sense that like romant, the culturally we are told as women that once your worth and your kind of fertility and your primacy as a young woman disappears, you disappear too. Mm. That it's not just that you, you become invisible to other people, it's that you become invisible to yourself. And I do think that there that, that is changing and there are different things at play that are that are enabling that to change. And and women of a certain age are becoming much more much more resistant to that being, you know, the fate that society wants to kind of push on us, because I'm of that age now. Um, but I also think that it's so telling that no one ever says, like the culture doesn't say to men, if you don't find a romantic partner to spend the rest of your life with, it will be a life half lived. If you don't have children, it will be a life half lived. You won't really know what it's like to love or to be happy unless you're in a position where you literally bring another human into the world and you find a man. And it does, it, it does carry over into queer relationships as well, but the primacy is still very much fixated on heteronormativity. Unless you find a man to pick you to live with him for the rest of your life, you will essentially fail. We've got just got a child walk in, so um, painting has fallen down ground. in the house. Oh, are you a lot ready? of whispering happening here right now. Oh. So I'll just talk help? to you. So that sense of like, um, Alice is just oh, going to go off and help the children. It's something I've been talking about a lot as I've been discussing the book with people uh, that the idea that one thing I really didn't want to explore so much in writing this book about love was successful romantic love, I guess. Um, and not because I'm, you know, opposed to it, but I just actually think that successful romantic love is so much less common than we think it is. Mm. And it's so much less important than we think it is, which is not to say that people who have it don't experience a lot of joy and don't feel blessed by it. But why is it that we have been culturally attuned to value that kind of love more than the love that we might have with someone who as I said like I described as my soulmate someone one of like you can't just have one soulmate in life but like I said to a friend recently um who I spend a lot of time with who lives around the corner from me and you know we're both um untethered which I think is a much nicer way of talking about single people is to say and single women in particular is to call them untethered mm. um but I said to her if we lived together if we were just best friends and our, our relationship was not at all romantic. Or say, let's just use you and mm. me as an example. And our relationship is slightly more complicated than that. But if we were just best friends and we lived together and we spent all of our time together and maybe we even owned a business together, which we worked out all the time and we parented our children together and we, but we, but it was clear to other people, we said, we're not in a romantic partnership. We're just best friends. We're like human life partners. People would say, it's weird. It's weird that you guys live together. It's weird that you do everything together. It's weird that you share a bed together. It's weird that you have a business. Don't you think that you should like have a life outside of each other? Don't you think that you should like, by living this way together, you're preventing yourself from finding a romantic love that will give you mm a better sense of satisfaction. But if you were a man and I was partnered with you and 
and we were romantically entangled and we were married and we shared a bed together and we had a business together and we spent all of our time together, people would be like, they're so in love. You it's know, so wonderful. They're so in love. That I want true, that. If we did have that and then people were like, why don't you get rid of Alice and find a man? What you would be trading is you would be trading me in for the same scenario, but where you had to do twice as much housework. <laughs> and no one listened to me. <laughs> I just wanted to say before when you were talking about women of a certain age, one of the kind of unarticulated secrets, I think, which is not a secret to anyone who's who's a woman of a certain age, is that what, what, what I've noticed happen is that women start to gravitate towards each other. And I think it generally, well, for me, it started when I had kids because... Um, you're in a landscape of only women a lot of the time because men are often at work but I'm just thinking that there's something sort of sad culturally about that when we see women groups of women together with mm. the sort of pitiable and yet I can't imagine that same aspersion being cast on a group of men together you don't think oh poor them <laughs> yes <laughs> Although poor them because they're probably not really we having deep emotional that. conversations. Yeah. Maybe they are, that it might be changing. Be I do think that, that that's true. Yourself. That And it comes back to that idea that if women, that, that women for other women only ever serve the purpose of being a stopgap, you know, that women mm. who love each other platonically and have like a depth of platonic intimacy and and truly, you know, when if it comes back to what, I've, I talk about in this book about love being the desire to be known and to be seen and to really be heard that other women for me, this is just my experience. It may not be everyone's experience, but other women for me have always fulfilled that purpose much more so than, than male friends and much more so than ma male lovers. Um, and in fact, actually, like my female friends have also filled that purpose more than female lovers, because for me, there's a barrier that sometimes exists with romance, you know, that you have to, um, the, in the, there's a chapter in the book called Every Single Moment of My Time. And it's about a dear friend of mine who in the book is called Billy O'Reilly and she's a musician. And it's kind of exploring what happens when you, could, you can make the choice about a relationship becoming romantic or remaining platonic. And so often we, or it's kind of assumed in society that if you make, if you choose to keep a, romantic, a relationship platonic, that you're limiting it somehow. You're putting, mm. you're closing the doors on possibility with that person. When actually my experience has always been that for me personally, if you close the door on romance, you open up so many more other avenues of possibility for connection and for intimacy and for, you know, the truth of being known and being understood. And that's sort of what happened with, me and Billy or with Billy and Billy and me I, yeah that's grammatically correct not that grammar really matters but that's what happened with Billy and me and she she's a, a musician and she wrote a song about me at the time and the the chorus was Clementine thank you for teaching because Billy's like a, a kind of serial monogamist and has always been in very long-term relationships and also one of those she's such a magnetic woman and her experience was um I think that it was we we met at a time we went to school together but we weren't friends with each other at school she didn't know who I was and we met later on just as she was coming out of a really long-term relationship with the mother of her child and she said to me you were the first friend who belonged just to me mm -hmm. and and it creates a level of intimacy with someone where sometimes I think because we do place that romantic, that primacy on romantic relationships, that it, we can be confused by what it is that we feel so strongly for someone and, and so much like you've met your person or one of your people in the world. And the only way that we understand how to express that desire for them and that intimacy for them is to, is to make it romantic when actually making it romantic sometimes limits it in a way that, and often limits it actually, in a way that means that you'll never truly be able to connect with them because you can be naked and raw and vulnerable in front of platonic friends in a way that I struggle a little bit to be that way in front of romantic lovers because I I guess maybe my own personal thing is that I never I feel way less able to trust in those situations and that's true for a lot of people um and so Billy wrote this song for me where she said thank you for teaching me how to say no and you said no too and now there's a chance that I won't lose you 
I think that we just don't really understand or make a place in the world for the importance of relationships that will be with us from the moment that we meet them till hopefully the moment that we die, where, you know, we mentioned before the article about Philippa Foot. It's Philippa Foot, right? I think so, yeah. Philippa yeah. Foot and Iris Murdoch, and Alice sent it to me this week, and it's, you know, Iris Murdoch, the famed philosopher who had this lifelong friendship with Philippa Foot, and it's essentially the same thing. that, And they did make the relationship sexual at one point, um, but realised that's not, that that was a way for them to physically express the desire that they had for each other's, for each other as humans, but that ultimately wasn't going to serve the purpose of their relationship and was, and was probably going to harm them at some point too. This is making me think of two kind of interconnected things that I want to ask you about. One is, I know we've often talked and you said, you know, like, you know, in the, in the kind of the milieu, people have a lot of things to say about you and some of them are not. No, no one <laughs> ever has anything to say about me. Nothing bad. But you always say, but nobody ever asks me why women love me. And I think that's a really good question. Like, I didn't mean to uh, parody it because I think it's a really good question. Like, you're eminently, you know, you're amazing in that capacity. And I, I feel just, like I didn't put it quite like that. <laughs> <laughs> that's how I think you know I think about it often like I mean I don't I don't wonder why women love you I, I guess it's a question of like what have you done or what is it that you're doing that draws people to you and I wonder I'm just as you're talking about your book I'm wondering if it's you're talking about love as something about being seen and known and I'm wondering if you're just very good at making people feel that even when they don't know you I did think recently okay so so just going back a little bit on what you said, I I have one of the reasons why I wanted to write this book, I suppose, is that I felt the desire to be understood and I have felt quite misunderstood in my career. And when I was younger, I think that the being misunderstood was a little bit of a provocative motivation, like, yes, let them misunderstand me. I love it. I love to be misunderstood by dickheads. <laughs> and it's not so much that I want people I don't, agree with or who politically enrage me to understand me but I feel a sense of I feel a distance from the same kind of motivation towards you know I described it recently as being like I don't want to be the enfant terrible anymore and I can't be because I'm no longer an infant like <laughs> I'm 40 and I feel like at some point you know I have a body of work that is more than just the character that is kind of perceived online or whatever and and it's actually not that unusual that I would write a book like this because I've been writing this stuff my whole career I've written lots of things about grief and love and mm. what it means to be human and it's funny that it still comes as a whoa we didn't know that she cared about this stuff um but what you're saying is the opposite of what I'm saying in some way, because you're talking about your own desire to be known. But I think the outcome of expressing that or making work that tries to meet that need to, for your, you to be known, the outcome is actually that other people feel known by you in well, some way. Well, I was. Or they recognize if you, themselves. If you let me get to the point, Alice. Get to the I, point. Know that I, I know that I talk <laughs> a lot, but. Um, uh, so that's one of was one of the motivations, but it's been interesting that you know, sometimes the point comes up of like, you're so divisive, you make mm. people so angry. And it's been a constant refrain throughout my career. And yes, um, no one ever says, well, if she's so enraging, why, why is she still around? You know, I don't mm. think that I'm just a shock jock. And there are lots of people who do, as you say, it's so weird to talk about yourself in these terms because it's, it's and also we've been taught as women, particularly with Australia's tall poppy stuff that we should never say that we're doing a good job. But I do think that there are a lot of women and even a lot of men who feel seen in some way by my work and who, you know, and with where the men are concerned, they feel like patriarchy hasn't served them and they've never been able to give voice to it or they haven't been given permission to give voice to it. And there's some recognition and there's some sense of being seen and understood um, and I do think that that's true. And I actually thought recently I'm, I'm getting a website made soon because we kind of all have to keep constantly rethinking the way that we work in these weird times, particularly when you're always being threatened with being kicked off Instagram. Um, 
But I thought the tagline could, for the website could be the place to be seen, you know, which is sort of like a cute kind of, yeah, you know, beautiful. come here to be seen. But like actually what I want women in particular, but I think it's also wonderful that men feel this way too. I want them to feel seen because I know so many women and so many women who, who've actually like ticked off all the boxes of things that society tells them they should pursue, which is to become mums, to have, to be married to men, don't feel seen in their mm. own lives. And so that's also one of the things that's gotten me thinking about this place that romantic love plays in our life and how much of a lie it is for so many of us, because what is romantic love and what is the point of it if the person you're lying in bed with at night has no curiosity about who you are as a human, doesn't, couldn't even tell you basic things or couldn't tell someone else basic things about you and your life and your experiences. And that when asked, what do you love about this person? Very often will say, I love how well she takes care of us. You know, which is sort of been framed always as this kind of like thing that women should, should, want to be praised in that way that oh I love how good a carer she is for me but we don't want that like women don't want that they don't want to go home at the end of the day and they may not know it yet they may not even be able to articulate it to themselves but I think even the most like vehemently conservative woman if she truly peeled it back does not want to go home to someone where she feels like that's all she is she could just be anyone she could just be anybody how do you think like this is one of, it's perfectly um, matches this question I've written in this blue text of belonging to one of my children how do you think that women and men also can think about love then in a way that's emancipating within that context of romantic love is it possible is that why you've um, broadened the scope in your book to include all kinds of love because it isn't possible well I had that's not why I've broadened the scope it's it's genuinely because all kinds of love are more interesting to me, Yeah, you know, and, and romantic love that ultimately kind of ends is more interesting to me than romantic love that lasts. Do you think that we're all destined to be crushed by love when we en enter into those romantic dynamics? I, do, I don't think we're destined to be crushed by love, but I think that for almost all of us, we're probably, if we enter into those romantic dynamics with any kind of expectation that they will fulfill a script that we've been swallowing, not even for like, not even forever, because romantic love is a very, romantic love as a lifelong prospect is a very modern concept. Mm. You know, romantic love and, and lust has always been a fuel for humanity and for the human condition, but it's only really been in the last what, like 150, 200 years that maybe even more recently than that, that people would marry for love. Like that's absurd that people would marry for love. Yeah. It's, it's never been the purpose of marriage. So I feel like almost in a way what I'm saying is that, or one of the things that I personally would advocate for is to never think that romantic love will be the thing that completes you. Do you think that part of the reason we get into trouble is that if, you, as you say, love is, being known then women are trained to see the point of being chosen as that recognition this yeah. person's chosen me therefore they see me they 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 know me and yet there's no follow-up like you can be married to that person for 50 more years and mm. they've already done their job and that's why that curiosity falls off it's funny because I was talking with a friend recently about the and again like I'm I I you know, when we're having this particular conversation, it's still, I'm going to say it again, it's still happening in very heteronormative terms because mm. that's how, that's what the culture dictates and that's what the culture places the value on. Um, and I think that we can all accept that heteronormative approaches to love are very often conservative in a way and, and unimaginative in, in, a, in a way, in a, in a very huge way. Um, so that's what we're talking about in, in this context. But I was saying to a friend that it's so funny that um, now I've lost what I was saying. What was your question? It was about that being seen and known. Being seen and known. But, oh, yeah, yeah, that's right. So one of the reasons we were discussing the continued practice of women in particular when they marry men, changing their names at the point of marriage. 
and mm-hmm. why this still occurs when there's absolutely no need for it to happen. It's not easier as some people argue. And, you know, yes, you can say, well, it's a choice and all choices should be respected, but no choice is made in a vacuum. We make choices based on a matter of like how easy it will be for us to move through the world. Um, And one of the things that I have been thinking about is that there are very few circumstances in a patriarchal culture in which women are allowed to be the centre of attention. Mm. And their wedding day is one of those times when they can be the centre of attention and they can be a bridezilla and every other name that we give to it, you know, they can... They can wear a princess dress if they want to. And they can, weirdly, the practice is not speak because traditionally brides don't speak and mothers of brides don't speak. The men stand up and they say things about this woman and this this kind of, they, they ostentatiously talk about the women involved in weddings as if they know them. Um, (laughs) And so it's, it's the one time when women can be, the center of attention and, and never have anyone turn around and say, well, she's just looking for attention. You know, women are not allowed to seek attention for the things that we care about, but we are told to accept attention for the things that we don't want, you know? So, and the ironic thing as well, like if you take the basic example of like being cat called on the street, well, it's a compliment. You should accept the compliment. You know, you're getting attention you don't want, but by complaining about it, you're seeking attention in a way that's bad. Um, so, so the wedding is, is one day where women can be the center of attention. If you threw a party for like achieving your PhD, which I know you are a doctor, you've achieved your PhD. If you threw a party for that, you'd have some people who came along and they'd be like, it's so wonderful that Alice has achieved her PhD. But an acceptable celebration for that in the eyes of society would be lunch at the pub. <laughs> you know? I and thought they should have maybe a few times. into the sky. But if you if you were like, come to my PhD day, <laughs> and it was a sit down formal dinner, and you walked in wearing a dress, dress from the labyrinth, <laughs> and you had a first dance as a doctor, <laughs> and you had people stand up and give speeches about you and this how magnificent you were, you would. I mean, that's what I wanted to do for my fortieth, and it was cancelled for, <laughs> for because of lockdown. So we're doing it next year. Um, but because I'm never going to get married, I never wanted to be married. And I thought, well, fuck it. Why don't I get a party where I get to wear an amazing dress and do a dance and everyone can celebrate me? Um, so if you did that, people would be like, it's a bit much. <laughs> but also in that kind of heteronormative framework, women who get married can acceptably expect, and maybe it'll be the only time in their the lifespan of their relationship that this happens that the man they love and do things for and take care of will stand up in front of a room full of people and tell them he loves her and tell them that he's proud to be with her. And he might just be fucking bullshitting because if you actually sat down and said, what do you know about her? That's one of the things that I always say to women, don't ask men, what do you like about me? Ask them, what do you know about me? Mm. And the answers to those two questions are very different. I want to ask you just, I know we've only got five minutes and then we'd love to hear some questions from all of you. Um, I'm sure you've got lots of things you'd like to ask, Clem. But I, as somebody who's um, present in your life and gets to observe you both in your professional capacity and also in the world as a person, I noticed like some interesting things. It's very interesting to observe. It, the crux of what I'm saying is it's interesting to be a friend of a famous person because everywhere we go, people approach Clementine and she's very lovely and gracious and engages with that, with everybody like um, beautifully and warmly, um, but you can never have a private moment but, and that's fine. I understand that's part of your work, but one of the, so there's that kind of um, warmth of response everywhere you go from people in, in the street. And at the same time, I know online you cop a lot of abuse And I just wonder how, you know, so you've got these kind of extreme experiences where you're loved and you're hated and it's like, but you're a person everywhere you go. And and I'm thinking about that and I'm thinking about how women culturally are required to actually be the opposite of all of those things, not to have an extreme response, but to be quiet and small and meek and nice. And I just wonder, and there's, I don't know how to really put this except to say, do you think that your work makes you somehow less lovable? Hmm. I mean, 
as it like like because publicly I, or I, I don't know does that complicate things for you because you're you're obviously widely loved like all these people here have come to see you speak and but on some other level because you're you're going against the tide of what women are meant to be on some mm. level does that complicate how you experience love or I think um mm, yeah it's, a, it's an interesting question because you know, while you were saying that, I was thinking about how that sort of like wild extremity of response to me and how strange it can be in your own perception of self. What does it mean to be a person who some people think does a lot of good and some people think is the devil incarnate and <laughs> and has and have told me that you know that worse than hitler i hear a lot worse than hitler <laughs> um so what does that do to your sense of self and to your to the way that you kind of perform the person you are in the world and i would say that there are probably i'm i'm not I, i'm kind of an introvert and I don't love large groups of people, and I can I can um, I can engage very well in that way. But I much prefer my like my circle is very tight, is what I'm saying. And it's funny that when I go out to dinner with my friends, I often sit there because I've got so much social anxiety as well. And my real self, my real human self, beyond the performance of what it means to be me the character will invariably sit at dinner parties with friends and think I am not cool enough to be here <laughs> and they are gonna know <laughs> and they're gonna kick me out um and I feel like that's probably quite common to a lot of people who have reasonably public lives and it's strange I guess as well because I'm very well known in Melbourne and have I'm, a, I'm less likely to be approached outside of here so it also then gives you this weird sense of like in some places you you kind of oh god it's hard to say this without sounding like a wanker but you're aware that people might be watching you and so you naturally and without even mm. thinking about it adjust the way that you're experiencing the world and and you're constantly kind of in a way that can sometimes be very delicious actually performing a daily task um and then you are in an environment where you're like literally no one here knows who I am so I can just be in exactly who I am and and then you're kind of confronted with your inherent wankery um <laughs> which is always good it's very humbling to to kind of remind yourself that you're just playing dress ups essentially with a personality um but I think I don't think that it I don't think that it makes me unlovable, but I think that I find it difficult as a result to trust what genuine connection is, um, which is one of the problems that I had with Alice when we first met was that Alice is such a warm, like a naturally warm person who when she decides you're going to be her friend, she makes you her friend because she's just such, and she's the person who anyone who knows her and loves her will say that she's, she's the, not the organizer, that's kind of a, a very drudgery way of putting you, but she's, she's in, she's a nucleus and a lot of people orbit around her. And a lot of people feel blessed to be in the glow of the sun that is Alice. But when I first met her, I wasn't sure what her motivations were in asking me to like, we met in a mum's group actually. And I wasn't sure what her motivations were in inviting me to do stuff because there was a part of me that was like, well, is this genuine on her part or is it collecting in some way? Because I didn't know her. And then she asked me to launch her book, The Glad Chat, which is incredible. It's her second book. It won the Readings Prize for Fiction in 2019. It's brilliant. Please, She's a much she's a significantly better writer than me and I think I'm a pretty good writer. Um, <laughs> and you, you, you must read it. And she asked me to launch the book and I was like, okay. Um, feeling again, like someone was trying to get something out of me. And it wasn't that she was trying to get, I wasn't even annoyed that I thought she was trying to get something material out of me. I thought that maybe she was trying to like get something emotional out of me, which, which always puts me on edge. Um, 
and she, she sent the book to me and I left it a few days before picking it up to read. I was like, I better read this book before I launch it. <laughs> and just like read the whole thing in one sitting and finish it just feeling like, oh God, this woman is so talented. And I, I hate how talented she is, but it's so amazing. And I mean, I'm joking when I say how, I hate how talented she is. Um, I was just completely blown away by how incredible her writing was. And um, I just have a small child off on the side of the screen. And um, just a few more minutes, son, darling. Oh, well, Alice, we'll just get you We a... need to go to questions. So oh, yeah, yeah. I'll, I'll, just, I'll, just, I'll just wrap that up quickly. Um, and I launched the book and I was like, okay, I'm going to make you my person now. And um, I don't know that that necessarily answered Alice's question, but I... I think I am like anyone, and maybe a lot of you will relate to this, I am a flawed human moving through the world who when you get to a certain age and you begin to be able to reflect more critically and also with some sense of forgiveness about who you were as a child and about things that may have happened to you or about your experience and how, how terribly you held those little people inside you to account for things that were beyond their control. That there is, a, what I'm realizing now as a 40 year old woman is that the compassion that we are capable of having if we conceive of ourselves as a series of millions of different people who are iterations of the same one human, which is me, but, but that also when I think of myself at 13, who, who is so present in the book is not me. It is me, but it's also a, an entirely separate human and I can think of her finally as someone who is worthy of respect and of kindness and of protection and I, things I didn't, I wouldn't have been able to think of at the time and that I just was so like full of self-loathing and self-hatred. Um, so maybe what I'm really saying is that the question isn't so much whether or not I'm perceived as being unlovable, but how much can we get to the point with age and wisdom and reflecting on issues of love that we can make ourselves lovable in our mm, eyes when we always felt beautiful. so like inherently wrong. Oh, that's beautiful. Let's hope that it happens automatically with age. We've got time for questions yeah. now. Yeah. Would anyone like to ask a question? Okay. I've got some questions that have been sent through. So the first one is from Toby. Uh, and Toby said, is Prince Charming and, Cinder and Cinderella the myth that always will be? And why did the majority of both sexes hold on to such a myth? Mm -hmm. um, Prince Charming and like the whole Disney kind of fair. I mean, it's so funny that Disney recreated very dark fairy tales that essentially were warnings against all of these things. <laughs> um, this is a question that actually I keep coming back to is that you can logically know all of these things. And I feel in my life, like I truly have been able to divest myself of any of the kind of um, hopes or desires that I had as a young woman for a, an everlasting love, much of which was, and I didn't super go into it in the book, but much of which was really um, propelled by my parents' relationship, which was always kind of mythologized to us as being this great mm. love, which, you know, after my mum died and my dad remarried and um, there's, it's been a sort of tumultuous road in some ways. Um, and you also you get older and you think, oh, hmm, probably wasn't always like beer and Skittles. Um, I think that it serves, I mean, this is a very kind of unpopularly political answer but it serves capitalism to make women and it serves patriarchy to make women hold so steadfastly to the idea of the the one true love you know that finding the one like how it's it makes no logical sense that there would be one person in the world for you um but the idea that we'd find the one who will be our person above all people and I think what it ultimately ends up doing is keeping women in particular in relationships that are really detrimental to them emotionally, economically, um, finan uh, so financially is economically, um, domestically. And yes, like you could say, well, economically, some women are served by marriage, but that's only because the culture makes women reliant on marriage in order to have any kind of independence. If we could all, like I am a woman who very fortunately makes 
her own income and can make the choice, I could make the choice to leave a relationship that wasn't serving me and that I felt stifled by in many ways and that I could see down the barrel of for the next 20 years and waking up one day and thinking, what what happened? Where did all the time go? Who am I now? Like, why Mm. did I give my life to something that I was just doing it because it seemed like the right thing to do, or it seemed like that should I, that's what I should want. Um, but obviously most women aren't as free to make those choices. And that's where the problem lies. And that's why the culture insists on this romanticized ideal of marriage for women and particularly marriage to men for women, because without women serving men domestically, there's no patriarchy. Mm. Right. Um, Okay, the next question is actually for you, Alice. Um, So, Alice, as Clementine's friend, how does it make you feel when you see the online hate come through? That's a really good question. Actually, weirdly... She's responsible for some (laughs) of it. I find it really horrific, but I also find it really comforting to know, and I might be wrong about this, but I think I get the impression that it, that Clementine is quite inured against it, that it doesn't penetrate that deeply. Am I wrong yeah, about that? Yeah, that's that? true. And so when I see it, I feel sick in myself, but I also feel that it's not that bad for her because maybe because of practice, which is mm. a terrible thing to think. Um, so it's easy to dismiss, I suppose. But maybe that's it's actually making me think, like if you live in a landscape that's... Um, like defiled by fire or like a post-apocalyptic landscape and you look around and think this isn't so bad does that make it okay I don't know uh it's troubling actually maybe I should think of I'm sorry I can can completely relate to that because I am inured against it and I am also kind of like quite eye rolly about it and Alice will tell you that the thing that really truly bothers me is feeling dismissed as a writer, you know, like, oh, she's popular, so she must be shit. And I, that's kind of mostly what I call up in terms of like online stuff. I'm, I call up to kind of whinge about that, you know, I feel like very in my feelings about this idea of like somehow being kind of sneered at intellectually. Um, the trolls and stuff don't bother me. But when I have seen like my colleagues and, you know, female friends experiencing the same, it's gutting and it makes me want to pick up an axe and go and like harm people physically um so I appreciate that I actually think that for the people who love me it's much worse than it is for me to experience that okay (laughs) me about it because she just so (laughs) self-involved um so tara would like to know what was the best thing and what was the hardest thing about writing this book good question the best thing was finishing it for sure (laughs) um as any writer will tell you the best thing is knowing that it's finally finished no but but sort of while it was going i think it was very i can now reflect on like the emotional process of writing it and and think that it was so valuable to me to be in a space where I not only was not like, you know, from a very practical point of view, I wasn't kind of enmeshed in terrible things day in and day out, you know, that I wasn't Mm. like coming home. Like when I wrote Boys Will Be Boys in particular, I would come home often and just feel really numb. And I sort of had, I did have a mental breakdown after writing that book for many reasons, not just because of the book, but because it's really hard to be in a space every day where you're just, reading the most terrible things that you can read and because you need to write about them um but the other thing that was that has been so amazing in writing this book is that it has I don't want to sound sort of like because it's not it's by no means a self-help book not that I'm denigrating self-help books it's just not that but I felt afterwards very um I sort of kind of touched on this before, healed in a way because I was able to like explore some things that I hadn't necessarily thought about deeply or that I had thought about deeply, but that I hadn't thought about as a 40 year old person. And I think being able to, as a woman in particular, or maybe just a human in the world, look back on circumstances of your childhood and feel that sense of, of you know, compassion for who you were 
was a very transformative process being able to kind of be kinder to yourself and to think of I was always so publicly disparaging of younger me in a sort of like way mm. to kind of make a joke oh look at her she's such a dork she's such a loser you know look oh I was so uncool when I was growing up and you kind of feel like that self-deprecation is a is a way of protecting yourself against something and you don't realize until a certain point that what you're doing is trying to protect yourself against yourself um and now I feel a lot more uh I feel like I can be that younger me's parent and protect her in a way that she you know, my family was great. Like, I'm not saying anything against them, but that just that she didn't really have anyone protecting her at times. So she really fumbled her way through it like we all do. And we make this mistake as well of thinking that, you know, people say to me, how are you so strong now about certain things or whatever? But 40-year-old me might be strong against online abuse because 25-year-old me, when she first started writing, it was kind of, you know, un had an a load of it unleashed against her. She wasn't mm. as equipped to deal with it as I am now, but she did it. She did it in a way that made me able to kind of brush it off now. And 13 year old me similarly was certainly not equipped to be in situations where she was really kind of figuring things out for herself. And I, you know, my dad was working overseas and my mum was very depressed. So I was kind of like a ab had absent parents to a degree and people pick up on that and you can get yourself into situations where you don't have control over it. Mm. And Jesus, like a 13 year old girl navigating that. That's amazing. I have, you can look back at yourself and all of the different versions of yourself. And instead of feeling anger and shame and hatred towards them, you can give them the gift of finally looking at them as an adult should and you can thank them for who they were and how they got you to this point. And you can praise them and you can speak to them the way that you would speak to your own child. Because I would never say to my own child the things that I've said to myself yeah. and about myself in the past. And the worst thing about writing the book was, um, well, I don't even think that there really was a worst thing. Just any process of writing a book is quite emotionally difficult and you you go through so many periods of self doubt and can I do this? Will I will I acquit the subject properly? Um, will anyone want to read it? Will anyone want to read it? Why am I? The worst part about it probably was coming to terms with the fact that writing a memoir necessarily means writing about yourself in a way that is vulnerable because you can't just hide behind humor with everything and there is humor in the book but you have to also say to people this is the bit where I'm going to be earnest and I'm going to maybe like bleed a little bit in front of you and I hope that you're okay with that and that was quite challenging for me because I've always hidden behind humor and or politics or whatever um yeah okay uh Karen would like to know well Karen thinks that friendship breakups hurt more than romantic breakups and would like to know what both of you think absolutely I'm going to quote from my favorite one of my favorite movies, Beaches, <laughs> which is so regularly fucking dismissed as because of course it's a book, it's a movie about women. Can I just say one of the saddest truths of my life is that in all of these like cultural artifacts where there's a duo, I'm always the sad, like nerdy one and Clem always gets that to be the glamorous. That is not true. true. That is not true. true. You get to be Bette Midler and I have to be the other one who That's dies not true. at the end. <laughs> Alice has always thought of herself as Anne Shirley. And I say, no, you're Diana Barry. Diana Barry is glamorous. And Nobody wants to Anne Diana. Shirley is desperately in love with Diana Barry. Diana Barry is not in love with Anne Shirley. Anne is like, she's the one who says to Diana, you're my kindred spirit. We're bosom buddies. You know, Aunt Diana is the place to be. Um, <laughs> that's not true. But that's so okay. in Beaches, when they have their... I, if you haven't seen it, you must watch it. Just let go of any kind of sexist stereotype you have. It's a masterpiece of a film. Um, and and Bette Midler wouldn't have done it if it wasn't. <laughs> when when Cece Bloom and Hillary Whitney fall out because Hillary Whitney has come to New York and she's just mm. and she's jealous of Cece Bloom's new life. And but she can't tell her that. She can't tell her that she's jealous because Cece's done everything that she said she would do. And they fall out and, and Hillary is so snobby to her. 
and they break up and they have this terrible fight in Bloomingdale's and on the flight home, Hillary cries on the plane and then they don't talk for maybe a few years or, or months at least. Um, and there's a scene where Cece Bloom is speaking to her husband who she kind of got by default because he was in love with Hillary Whitney first, which is a whole other kettle of fish when you're talking about friendships and love and the most important relationship of your life, which is with your best girlfriend. Um, she's crying about how this relationship is broken down and he turns to John turns to her and he says, she, she says to him, what will I do without a best friend? And he says, you've got me. And she says, it's not the same. And it's not the same, like losing a friend who, and there's so, we all know that there's those friends that you have where they, they do transcend romance and platonic intimate. Like there's something very Diana Barry and Anne Shirley about them. And they, they're the great loves of your life. And, but it's also true that we're not taught how to extract ourselves from those dynamics when they're not good anymore. No, no, that's it's true. So painful. It is painful. It is painful, but also the, at the same time, there are there are friendships that have a season as well, and yeah. they they feel so gutting at them in the time when they end. But with a little bit of benefit of hindsight, in much the same way as when relationships end, and they feel so gutting as well, that you realize you can really. It's not that you can get over anything as if they didn't mean anything, but you can come to a point where you say, well, some things are seasonal. Mm. And, and we, that's where the grief comes in that you can, you know, grief is not an emotion that we should shy away from because grief is the natural companion to love. Grief tells us that love meant something and, and missing something is, is an, as an important emotion as, as being happy with something. And I feel like we don't talk about grief enough and how, and the importance that it places in our life, that grief teaches us what it is meant to love and be human and to have lost as well. Okay, so we're nearly out of time. So I'll just ask two more questions. Um, so this one is romantic love and entitlement. Are men still believing they are entitled to have any woman fall in love with them? E.g. when Harry met Sally, men and women can't be friends. I've just today wrote to a younger relative as a friend of many years is pissed off because she won't shift to a romantic relationship when what she wants and needs is a friend. Mm. Alice? Well, When Harry Met Sally was written by Nora Ephron, so she's the one that's responsible both for men and women can't be friends and women are high maintenance, which is mm. devastating because Nora Ephron's so amazing. But also it's like you have to locate it in the time that it was a very nine, late 1980s film to make and it was so funny and sparkly and witty. And I maybe to a degree we all kind of, like when you're talking about When Harry Met Sally in particular, we all kind of have also been attuned to this romantic idea of the most meaningful of love being that mm. which you have to work hard for and you have to be friends first and then you make them fall in love with you and then you have the friend zone thing where men have been taught that the only way they can communicate and connect with women is romantically and that if she is offering friendship that this is the secondary mm. this is the loser's prize because there's a great article actually that's written by um I mention it in, I was just looked, looked around to see if I can't see my other book on your shelf, Alice. <laughs> These are the um, kids' books. <laughs> uh, there's a great article. I think it's Arthur Cho wrote it and it's called Mario, Your Princess is in Another Castle. And it's all about how patriarchy instills in men this belief that if they just work hard enough, they will get to the end of the, the level and they'll be able to rescue Princess Peach from the castle. And then that will be their reward that they get they get the princess at the end. And that's everything that pop culture has taught them too. You know, Han Solo just badgering Princess mm. Leia until she can't help but confess her love for him. Um, and it's really, you know, I think having spoken to some men about this as well, it's a really unhealthy position to be in. But it makes it so hard for women, you know, maybe it does come back to that Nora Ephron thing that men and women, it's not that men and women can't be friends, it's that the culture makes it so difficult for them to know how to be friends. Do you think that though there's also one of the things that I've experienced in my life without a partner is that when no. men feel that you've friend zoned them, they think you don't want to have sex with me. And when I feel that, you know, and I'm somebody who just wants just wants to be friends with me, 
I automatically think I'm not beautiful enough, mm. which is such a terrible conditioning. It's so terrible. And there's a bit in the book actually where in the bad texture chapter where I've kind of this terribly torturous love affair that I've been having with someone who I was obsessively, tediously in love with, in love, being obsessed, you know, it's not real love, but the more he didn't, the more he pulled back, the more I was like, but I love you. Mm. And when we finally kind of called it off and actually, you know, the upshot of that is that in much the same way that Billy and I became wonderful friends after we closed the door on romance. So, so too did happen with him and me. And maybe that's just what was the, that was what our relationship was meant to be. Mm. Um, but I, there's a scene where I'm saying to him when we're having this very mature adult conversation about ending things. And I say, you know, would things be, have been different if, if things were different, would things have been different between us? Because we were both very busy with work. And he said, oh, it's hard to say, you know, maybe if we'd had time, then we would have been able to, to see if there was something there. And I said, no, no, no. I mean, I mean, like, am I the kind of person that you would want to be with? And he said, oh yeah, you're smart and funny and you're a rat bag. And he said all these wonderful things about me. What? Get to the point. Yeah. And <laughs> I said, um, I, if I write, like I looked down at my feet and smiled and thought, no, you're still not getting it. What I really want to know is, do you think I'm pretty? And that's so much of what it comes down to for us, that if you're, if you're rejected in some way, we've so like heavily absorbed the lessons of patriarchy too, that all of these wonderful things about yourself and your accomplishments and achievements can be completely dismissed and eradicated because you think you're not pretty enough. And, and sadly, actually, that's the case for a lot of people because those things don't matter to a lot of people and and in Mm. fact they maybe detract from your appeal because you someone who is capable and a woman who's capable of looking after herself and entertaining other people is far less likely to to you know need um, anything to need you and to adore you okay and one last question um so this person has been following you for 20 years now um, from the earliest published pieces in The Age um, and says that it's fascinating and so lovely to see how you've evolved and grown. And their question is, what do you think you'll be writing about when you're 50 or 60? What a good question. That's a great question. Um, firstly, hello. Thank you so much for following my work for, for that length of time. It's, you know, that's amazing. And I'm so glad that you feel like I've evolved and grown as of course we all should. Um, I suspect when I'm 50, I'll be writing about menopause and about, you know, what it means to be battling climate destruction. (laughs) Um, I don't know. What will I be writing? I'd love to try my hand at, this sounds terrible. I'd love to be a brain surgeon. I'd love to try my hand at fiction. It scares the shit out of me to write fiction. And Alice, of course, is brilliant at it. Um, but even someone as brilliant as Alice makes it clear how hard it is to do. Um, I hope what I, I can tell you what I hope, and that is that I hope I always being, I, I'm always curious about what propels us as humans and always passionate about bringing to light in my corner of the world, bringing light to the things that we need to shine light on in order to change them and in order to, to address them. And that ultimately one day, well beyond 50, if I get there, that I'm able to look back on my life and think I tried my best I did some things that I'm really proud of and hopefully through the course of all of it, I was known in some way. Great. Well, I think that's a nice note to wrap up on. Thank you so much, uh, Clem and Alice. And Alice, I'll pass over to you to say a few final words. Thank you. Thank, thank you. Thank yes. you to everyone and to Avid Reader. Now you can interrupt uh, Thank you, you so. for coming and and. Um, One of the things, you know, no matter how often Clem and I speak or message each other, it's such a joy to see you in this mode Mm -hmm. because um, none of you will ever know how sort of on some level underprepared she always is because she's so busy (laughs) and yet how eloquent she is and clever and switched on she is in the moment and it's a wonder to behold and you're so impressive 
Thank you for inviting me to be here and thank you all for coming as well. It's one of the nicest things Alice has ever said about me. And I mean that genuinely. (laughs) She said it last week too, that no one will ever know how dreadfully unprepared (laughs) Clementine is always. And I think that that's a terribly wonderful gift to have to be able to turn up and fool people into thinking that you know know what what you're doing um I would like to say thank you to everyone for coming tonight and again for braving the online space thank you so much to avid reader thank you for people reading and buying the book but thank you so much to my dearest dearest wonderful Alice Robinson who I love so much Um, the book as well it's a beautiful book I hope you will enjoy it Thanks. (laughs) Thank you. Bye.